ever since Bow of the Last Guardian has come into the game, range has been a very strong combat style. And after this combat update, range is even stronger than ever. And in the last DPS guide, you guys have been asking for range on this current one, and I will be covering all combat styles as stated previously. However, we are covering range today in this DPS guide. Now, I want to give a disclaimer. I never claim nor will ever claim to be the best ranger in this game. I simply have put in a decent amount of time into learning the combat style, and I'm here to pass off all my findings to y'all out there who want to watch. These are findings I've had so far from testing during the combat update here in the live game and from other testing in the beta iterations for the combat beta before this update got pushed. And I hope some of y'all are able to pull bits of information from this guide and implement it into your own rotations and gear setups to help you do a little bit better at the bosses you are doing. Also, one quick thing, if you want to go above and beyond and support this channel in ways that I didn't even really think were possible, super thanks and memberships have been enabled on this channel. They've been enabled for a while, but I never really mentioned it before. And all of my videos will remain free on this channel, but how it will work is I usually upload at night and then schedule for the morning release of a video. And sometimes I leave it to channel members who can watch it early. This is usually about a 12 to 24 hour window. I don't have any plans for members only content right now or members only streams or anything like that. I don't think this channel is nearly big enough to pull something like that off. And guides will never be locked behind a paywall on this channel, so you have nothing to worry about there. But again, if you want to go above and beyond and support this channel, any super thanks or channel memberships would be greatly appreciated. But with that disclaimer about how I'm not the best and the sellout stuff all out of the way, let's go ahead and get into this guide. So starting off, we'll go with the worn equipment and the inventory that I have here. Now, yes, this looks like an absolute nightmare mess of an inventory. All I've done is I have pulled every potential use case for range DPS or DPM, whichever you want to call it, into a preset so we can talk about it individually. Like, I'll group, like, the worn equipment and stuff together. I'll do a little talk about the different arrow possibilities, EOFs, all of that good stuff. And there will be time codes on the buffer bar and in the description. So, you can go to the section that you want to hear about and not waste too much time listening to the, what's probably going to be an entire 40 to 50 minute guide. And to start off, we'll go ahead and talk about the worn equipment here. So I have the full Draco Lich armor set here. And basically what this armor set does is when you channel a full rapid fire, you get adrenaline per hit of the rapid fire. And once you've done the full eight hits of rapid fire, you then get a 40% crit buff based on how many pieces of the armor set you're wearing. Now with the full five piece, set that is seven seconds worth of 40 percent crit buff and it is the absolute best in slot armor set for range right now no questions asked elite ceramic does have a set effect but crossbows with that set effect while it is nice in a vacuum it is nowhere near strong enough to compete with a bow and the draco lich armor set now yes technically this is the elite draco lich armor but i'm just going to be calling it draco lich for simplicity's sake also i will be doing a dedicated section on the gear progression later on of what order you should get your gear in as kind of a general principle so stay tuned for that now as far as grim is concerned i pretty much will only run grim with range because i always go for crit builds at this point being that the entire armor set is based off of crit farming and pretty much guaranteeing crits on abilities. I have seen some people using full scripture or jazz scripture or when scripture in certain use cases. However, these are mostly for rotations that don't involve death spore stacks, and I pretty much don't do anything like that. So I'm not going to be covering that in this guide. I'll just be going over what rotations I use. And for the rotations that I use, Grim is 100% best in slot. Grim might be a little bit expensive here and there. However, the bosses that you can do with this armor set will more than outweigh the cost or you could go iron man mode and go do some solak and get free grim pages yourself that's personally what i do i'll just go solo solak for a couple hours get my grim charged up and then go do some other bossing and it works out rather nicely now the crown jewel of range dpm or dps is the bow of the last guardian now this bow has a passive effect and it has a special attack basically how the passive effect works is once 
counts, you get up to eight stacks. Any hit counts as a stack other than bleeds. So say you use a piercing shot, you get two stacks. If you use a dazing shot, you get one stack because piercing shot fires two arrows, dazing only fires one. And as you're doing your rotation, you will build up to say seven stacks or six, depending on what ability you wanna do this with. But for example, if you're on seven perfect equilibrium stacks and you press the snipe ability, once snipe fires out, it will then be the eighth stack and it will trigger the passive effect. And that passive effect will grant you another snipe hit because that's the ability you use to proc the effect. Or say you were on six perfect equilibrium stacks and you press dark bow. The first hit of dark bow would be stack seven. The second hit of dark bow would be stack eight, thus proccing the the effect in giving you a third dark bow hit. Now how the special attack plays into this is it essentially halves that requirement to where the stack that doubles whatever hit it gets is now stack number four. And the special attack itself is pretty strong and gives out a hit that will count for the passive. So if I go up to this dummy, and press auto in the weapon spec, you'll notice I now have two perfect equilibrium stacks and the spec timer will count down. And something fun you can do is say you're on two stacks and the spec is active, you can then press rapid fire, channel the full rapid fire. You'll start on two stacks with rapid, channel the full rapid, and because it's eight hits, it will go through twice and then end you on two stacks again, assuming you have the spec active this whole time. And because you have the elite Draculich armor on, you're pretty much gonna crit everything after that rapid fire, so you can press dark bow, which will then give you the third hit because that's hit three and four. And then you can press a piercing shot to give you two stacks. And then you can press dark bow again, which will be another triple dark bow. And then you could press Gricko after that and it'll put you on three stacks. And that is a lot of damage and adrenaline going out. You'll see this more in the rotations later. But suffice to say that Bow of the Glass Guardian is the crown jewel of range DPM right now. And it is 100% worthwhile investing into. It can be on the expensive side, but with some of the GP makers we have access to now, such as things like Elite Dungeon 1 or Zamorak, Raziol, even Raksha is a good money maker still. All of these bosses can print out quite a bit of GP per hour, and you can get up to a Bow of the Last Guardian in relatively short amounts of time. Now, as far as the Pernix Quiver, uh, I'm going to do a whole section dedicated to arrows. That's why I have them all here. But what I will say about it is it is nice that you get a max hit increase when targets are below 25% life points. It is kind of like the Ripper passive effect, but it is nice to have. Now, as far as rings are concerned, I pretty much will use Stalker's ring just for the extra crit damage. You sacrifice 1% crit strike chance in order to get a 3% additional critical strike damage. It's honestly not a whole lot, but I pretty much use it just about anywhere. Now, EOFs, I'm going to be going over in their own section, talking about all the different ones that I have. Have. But the nice thing about EOF is that it combines the Amulet of Souls and the Reaper Necklace, so you get the 3% accuracy buildup, plus you get an additional 10% on your overhead prayers, which is nice. And you also get some buffs to your soul split. Now the Zuck Cape for range is a little bit lackluster. Uh, on release, it was very strong. Uh, it buffs Deadshot, basically doing double the amount of damage and brings its adrenaline cost way down. It is a strong ability still, and it is very much useful in poison builds. But since poison builds are kind of limited to three main bosses, that being Art Glacor, Karapak, and Solak, it's not as useful, but it's still nice for in between death swift damage to have a dead shot go out. And it is still definitely worthwhile to have the Zuck Cape itself. And I highly recommend getting it. By the way, you don't need the hybrid cape in order to do range damage. The hybrid cape just makes things a lot easier because you can just put the same cape in all of your presets and you don't have to worry about swapping them out or having the extra bank space for all four of the capes. It is just convenient to have the hybrid cape. Now that pretty much wraps up all of the worn equipment. Let's actually get into the inventory. Now, as far as as arrow choice is concerned, I have pretty much every single arrow I can think of here that might potentially be useful in range combat, and we'll just work left to right. So here I have splintering arrows, and these used to be fun to play with when they came out during Krosis release, and I might see some potential of swapping. Essentially what these do is when you have them equipped, if you hit mutated dazing shot, you then have, I believe it's six seconds where all other hits will then count 
towards mutated dazing shot, or I think it's greater dazing shot now, but it'll count towards stack. So if you hit MDS and then you hit something like Gricko and piercing, instead of having to press this ability 10 times, you already have built up to 10 stacks there, or actually technically 11. And it buffs the number of stacks you can build for MDS or greater dazing shot, I should say. It increases it to 13 and adds a little bit of extra damage with it and allows you to easily use abilities like Salt the Wound. I honestly have not tested Salt the Wound and what its potential damage is post combat update because it used to just be 15% for a 10k so I might actually have to do a bit more testing on it. I could potentially see these arrows being used in some form of switch for MDS only. However, upkeeping them in a rotation is pretty annoying and with current rotations just doing more damage, I don't really see these getting used too often. And honestly, I just have them here to fill out the quiver more than anything else. Overall, don't worry about these too much if you're just doing some more basic range stuff. Jass Dragonbane arrows are hyper strong where they work which is basically Vorkath in Elite Dungeon 2, but they give you 30% damage and 20% accuracy where they do work. So if you have to farm out the ED2 log, definitely give these arrows a shot. They will absolutely clobber all of the dragons, especially now that we don't have to worry about a hit cap of 10 and 15k respectively for normal and critical strike hits. We just have an open hit cap of 30k and these arrows crush, and I mean absolutely crush, BSD. It's probably one of the more free skips now to go for a flight skip. Overall, highly recommend using these arrows any place that they work. Hands down, definitely keep some of these on hand. Full arrows keep the same idea as Dragonbane arrows. However, they only give 15% damage instead of 30, which I know only 15% damage. It's still a bunch. However, they do have an accuracy penalty to them. And to my understanding, how this works is is that if you originally had 100% accuracy at a boss, you're not going to deal with the 10% uh, hit chance, ruining your actual damage pulling away from the 15%. But at places where you did have accuracy problems in the old system, you're going to see some degradation in damage with these. So you can still use things like the hit chance calculator to figure things out and see if these are still worthwhile to use or not. Overall, these are a very strong arrow and are recommended to keep in a quiver somewhere. Now I'll go ahead ahead and skip order real quick to talk about when arrows right now when arrows are ridiculously strong instead of two percent damage per stack they now give three percent damage per stack all basic abilities will build stack and now not only thresholds can trigger the effect and give you all of that damage increase but now weapon specs can do that as well so you can in the start of your death swift rotation go ahead and hit gricko and then hit sgb and that sgb will give you a 21 percent damage increase Increase. And seeing how strong they are in certain records at Raksha right now, being almost in the sub-1 territory, I don't see these staying in-game in their current state, and I really haven't built out too many rotations around these and optimizing these, simply to the fact that I think they're going to get some type of nerf at some point. Now, this is Jagex. Nerfs like this are probably going to take quite a while. Uh, Greco, we didn't see a nerf for eight months. FSOA was in-game for like a year and a half. So who who knows how long these when arrows will stay like this. It could be next week. It could be next year. We really don't know. But suffice to say, when arrows right now are hyper strong and definitely get to use them before they see some type of potential damage nerf. But the short, short version on how these works is basic abilities build stacks. Each stack gives damage and accuracy per stack. It goes up to a maximum of 15 stacks. And then any threshold or special attack will utilize the stack then proc the effect, thus giving you the damage and accuracy buff for 15 seconds. Blackstone arrows are a kind of niche arrow. They were used at Zamorak in order to help with accuracy using full arrows. They were also used at places like Telos and Rock Boss. And essentially what they do is they attack the armor rating of a target, and it takes around 15 arrows to get it fully built up. But once you have all of the stacks built up, they stay on the 
target until the target is dead. There might be some places specifically where you have to watch out for phase transitions, but overall they pretty much stay on the target until death. They are nice to keep around in certain situations, but don't feel like you need to keep a special quiver of these for any reason, but they can be kind of handy to have around in case you need them. Bic arrows have seen a lot of talk in the past and not so much anymore, but they used to be hyper strong with the black crystal, the reduced healing crystal, basically never keeping you at full HP, so you could then use a reaver effect to trigger out a lot of poison damage. And the simple way to think about these arrows is you fire 200 of them into a target, you then get 400 stacks because one hit gives you two big stacks, and your poison hits go from doing anywhere from 9 to 1300s to then doing anywhere from 4 to 6k damage per poison splat. And with factored in on a full poison build, using the blood reaver effect and all of the healing potential you can build up in this game, poison can do a ridiculous amount of damage. And also, with the Dracolich effect being in game, you can now use death spores with a poison build in order to get a more consistent rotation going with building up the stacks, because before you had to sacrifice the Calgarian Demon out for the Blood Reaver to really take full advantage of a poison build. Technically, there's now a bit more skill involved with this, however, it's not really much of a skill increase because all you do is basically spam ECB all the time so you're not actually healing with your soul split but the fact that it starts out as a heal but then is turned into damage will still proc the blood reaver effect so it's perfectly fine to use ECB with this type of setup and you just adjust your blood reaver auto cast accordingly to the boss that you're doing so you kind of stay mid to high HP but you're not constantly dying and you can just keep soul split up the whole time during ECB and at the few places this method method works, it is very strong. Jass Demon Bane arrows work exactly the same as Jass Dragon Bane arrows, however they work on demon targets instead of dragon targets. The only place I've really seen this used is at High End Rage Zami, where people bring a range swap to get benefits on the demons that they may or may not have to kill. However, I'm not exactly sure if that's still part of the method. I know it was for a short amount of time, maybe we'll get a demon boss at some point. Or if you're doing some type of slayer task that involves demons, go ahead and use the arrows. Again, they are hyper, hyper strong at the places they work. However, the places that they do work is very limited. And last but not least, we have death spore arrows. Basically, how these arrows work is every time you land a critical strike, it will build a stack. Once you have built five stacks, it will then start a 10 second timer for you to use any threshold or ultimate or special attack ability, and it will give you that special special attack for free. Once you have consumed this effect, it goes on a one minute cooldown. However, any critical strike you land will then reduce its cooldown by a short amount of time, thus allowing you to get probably two to maybe three death spore procs per minute. However, what most people use this for is for getting a free death swiftness and then allowing them to use incendiary shot afterwards. Overall, these are a very strong arrow and I recommend everyone having a quiver with them. Now overall with quivers, I do have Hydrix bolts in all of them and that is just so when I do use an offhand or something like that, I have the bolts there and I just switch the quivers based on the arrows needed. However, if you don't need AoE from chins and an offhand crossbow, you could easily have two arrows in a quiver and have that quiver bounce somewhere in order for you to switch between two arrow types depending on what you're doing. So you could set one up with Death Spore and Wen Arrow, or Death Spore and Full Arrow, and then you have a easier, more clean preset to deal with because you only have one quiver. But this is how I have mine set up, and these are the different arrows that I carry. I will say the ones that get used the most often are Death Spore, Full, Wen, and Dragon Bane. I really don't use the other ones too often. I used to do more poison build stuff, but I haven't really done it as of recent. And as far as arrows, that's about it. As far as EOFs are concerned with range, there are the main three, and then there's kind of some ancillary ones I can discuss afterwards. But the main three we have here are ECB, SGB, and Dark Bow. ECB takes all of your soul split healing and turns it into damage. So you're not getting any of that healing back, and it is 
is potentially deadly. However, the extra damage is nothing to scoff at and is highly worthwhile as an EOF. SGB is a one global cooldown hit that hits a 5x5 area. And if your target is a 5x5, all of the arrows will hit. But essentially, one arrow is guaranteed and the other four are random. And so if you're attacking any large target like Raksha or Zamorak or Glacor, this is a very worthwhile spec. And even on 3x3s such as Solak, it is still worthwhile to use. Darkbow is probably going to be the first EOF you have for range before buying the other two. And while its adren cost is high, I believe with Vigor Passive, it's 58.5% adrenaline. Its damage output is absolutely no joke. I've seen this thing hit as high as 18 to 20,000 damage. And when you line it up with Bolg and get the third hit in, it is a lot of damage in a single game tick. Again, it is one global cooldown. Something I would like to see is ECB go off of global cooldown. I think it'd be really nice if we could proc this in the middle of global cooldown, kind of like how we can do freedom or voke. I don't really see too many downsides to this. I think it would just add a lot of flexibility into range rotations because the rotations are pretty tight right now, depending on what you have to implement, but we'll get into that later. And these three EOFs are the main three that you'll see most rangers using anywhere they go, assuming they have pretty much best in slot gear or someone working up through the ranks of range gear will probably have a dark bow and an ECB EOF, but they will have a physical SGB equipped. Yes, this is a keepsake ice SGB. It looks infinitely better than any bow of the last guardian die. You can fight me on that one. I don't care. Now, some of the more ancillary EOFs or maybe niche use case EOFs, you could call them, are things like decimation, which basically turns your bow into a three by three AOE for 10 seconds. Uh, think of chin range. It'll work exactly the same. And this used to not really be used outside of, I believe, AOD because it has a very high adrenaline cost, or it used to anyways. It used to be 55%, but now it's only around 35%. I don't quite remember what the adren cost is with Vigor Passive, but it's around 33%-ish. And in some places like ED2, it's really nice because now you can do AOE damage with your Dragonbane arrows and you're on a T95. So instead of using a tier 75 chin that has no perks, on it, you're getting full AoE damage with this EOF. In this EOF here, I have a Zamorak bow, which with the combat update is basically like a mini dark bow. And if you're getting a lot of adrenaline return and you don't want to use your snapshot or a piercing shot, you can use this in between dark bows after a rapid fire buff to get out extra damage. Or sometimes at Glacor, I've tested it where I just will sit there and spam Zami bow the entire time. And I believe the average damage is about the same as using like dark bow and piercing shot or dark bow and snapshot. At Glacor, I was seeing these max out around 13k, but they cost a lot less adrenaline, so it is something that you can weave into rotations. Also, there is a Ceradomen bow version of this that basically acts like a form of healing, and the heal is no longer capped to 400 health per tick, or global, I don't remember which one it is. I haven't experimented with Cerabow, I haven't found too much use for it yet, but basically it takes the damage that you do with its spec and then turns that into healing over time. I believe it's over a 15 second period. So if you want to use it for sustainment, maybe it's something a bit more AFK or you're doing a boss you find difficult and you want the sustain health, it can be helpful in a pinch, but personally I haven't found too much use for it yet. All right, now we'll kind of get into the miscellaneous uh, bits of gear that I have for range here. And you'll notice I do have chins and a couple offhand crossbows, but I don't have the main hand blight in here, and it's for a very good reason. And that's just due to the fact that anything that uses bolts right now is not really worth it in the current meta. Arrows are just significantly stronger than their bolt counterparts, and that has caused a meta shift. Now, this kind of brings up a bigger discussion of should the crossbows and the bows be split into different builds and whatnot. And that's a discussion I think for another video, but if you'd like to hear my thoughts on that, leave it in the comments below. But the only thing I've really found use for with blights is I have E4R3 on this one. So when I'm chinning, I get some good damage buff. Due to the fact that Ruthless 3 can add up a decent amount of damage, especially when AOE clearing with chins and Eruptive 4 is just a flat 2% damage increase. The other offhand here is a Karoming swap. So if you want Greco to be buffed when using chins, 
you can bring this along. However, I just have not found too much use outside of using chins to have any type of offhand. And you could even downgrade these to ascensions and it's not gonna make much of a difference if you wanna save a bit of cost. So personally, I can't really recommend crossbows right now as a Nox bow is going to significantly out DPS the ascension counterparts. Same with Saren God bow or obviously bow of the last guardian. The arrows are just that much stronger. Reaver's ring is here mostly for when I use range with some type of hybrid swap, although I will bring it along if I just need the flat out crit chance, because as I stated before, the stalker's ring, the 3% crit strike damage is not that big of a deal, honestly. The way crit strike damage works is say you hit a 10,000 and at level 90, we get a flat 50% increase on our critical strike damage. So you take 50% of 10,000, assuming this 10,000 is now turning into a crit, and then you add 5,000 on top of that, you get 15k damage. So instead of 50%, as far as I can tell, the 3% is just getting added on. So instead of a 15k, it is now a 15k 300, which over the course of doing a bunch of crits, it's going to be helpful, especially being that range is a very crit reliant combat style right now. So the 3% does add up more than you would think, especially for the sacrifice of 1%. I think on average, Stalker's Ring is going to be better. But if you're doing anything hybrid or you're bringing along chins, you will definitely want to bring along a Reaver's Ring, potentially as a swap, or you could just camp it if you just want to be a little bit more on the lazy side. Either is going to work fine, but it is something that I wanted to bring up. Now, you may have been staring this whole time at these two magic weapons right here and wondering why the heck are dual wield magic weapons sitting inside of a range DPS guide? And to answer that, it's pretty straightforward. It is for Tsunami and stalling it and releasing it or using Nami on a combat dummy. Well, we don't really need the combat dummy anymore because of guaranteed accuracy, but essentially it is a second form of crit buff when you're done using something like incendiary shot inside of your DS. You can use this either beforehand to late incendiary and let that crit buff carry over after your death swift, or you can use it in between. It just kind of depends on the boss setup you're doing, but being able to carry in an off style crit buff and release it with Natty on a dummy is always going to be very strong. And you'll see this used in some of the very high end Raksha setups specifically. And it's honestly something I haven't experimented with too much other than a couple times here at dummies. So I probably won't be showing a rotation utilizing this. I'll probably save that more for the specific guides because it is kind of niche, whereas melee, it's just universally better to buff up your Zerk with a natural instinct and an off style buff. Range rotations get a little bit more tricky and I haven't quite fully learned them yet. So this will just end up being a, as I figure it out more and more, I will let y'all guys know in some type of update video or just boss specific guides, but definitely give it a shot yourself. Bring a Nami swamp of some kind, stall it at wars or use it at bosses in between. And let me know what you guys think and what you guys have found to work so far for yourselves. Now, depending on what I am doing, I will be on ancients if I do want to play with some type of Nami buff for a speed of some kind or some type of hyper fast rotation with range camp. But typically I will just go ahead and run Lunar Spellbook and only carry two rune pouches. So that way I still have just quick access to Disrupt Shield, Vengeance, and my Smoke Cloud through borrowed power. And it does make life a lot easier. However, with this setup, you can't really use Nami because you're on Lunars but it is nice for kind of just a more straightforward setup. And as far as relics are concerned with range, I will actually run heightened senses over COE because on DS, I'm still getting the 10% benefit by being at max adrenaline. And on crit refund, it's nice to have the extra headroom for trying to spam out things such as dark bow that have a lot of adrenaline cost. And to help benefit more, I will get the extra adrenaline from Fury of the Small and Death Ward just to help out a little bit with survival on spamming out a bunch of E. CB. Although if you want to go full tilt, Fury of the Small does not make too much of a difference. So you could go Zerk Fury and Font of Life and it would work out just fine for you. And also the main reason I run Heightened Senses, not only for the headroom, but I don't really use Deadshot inside of my Death Swift rotations. That's more of an outside of Death Swift type of deal. So I don't really get too much benefit out of COE other than the start of DS. And if you play your rotations right, you'll be just fine. The room pouches here are just for kind of a standard magic setup. They have the standard, I believe these are still the standard PV 
PVME setup for rune pouches if you only have three of the grasping ones. So feel free to pause the video and look at these pouches and set them up if you want to. And I believe that pretty much wraps up everything about range gear that I can think of. Let's go ahead and get into some ability information. Abilities, for those who may not know, are broken up into three different types. We have basic abilities, we have threshold abilities, and we have ultimate abilities. Basic abilities do a decent amount of damage, but generate adrenaline. Threshold abilities do more damage, but consume adrenaline. And ultimate abilities do a lot of damage, but consume a lot of adrenaline. Or what they do is give you a time window in order to do increased damage with your basic and threshold abilities for the cost of a bunch of adrenaline. Out of the basic abilities, these are all pretty strong. MDS or Greater Dazing Shot, it used to be called Mutated Dazing Shot and we've called it MDS for a long time. For those in the RuneScape Boomer crowd and remember it as MDS. So if you hear me referencing it like that, then just understand that's where it comes from. But this is a pretty decent bread and butter. You'll probably be using this every three or four abilities or so. It's a good filler. And it has a short cooldown of 5.4 seconds. So you can use it every Every third ability should you need to build adrenaline. Piercing Shot has the shortest cooldown and it fires two pretty weak hits but it's nice for stack building with Bow of the Last Guardian so it's actually used a decent amount and it has an effect with it where if something is stunned or bound it will do increased damage but overall it's kind of a weak basic. Binding Shot is a decent basic ability and it can be boosted by the flanking perk. I have thought about getting a separate Bow of the Last Guardian just to have flanking for erupt to as a switch for binding shot. There are a few places where I could use it, but overall three bill for a single ability swap probably doesn't seem too worthwhile right now. But overall, it is a decent basic. Fragmentation shot and corruption shot are your two basic bleeds that you have. Frag shot works kind of like combust, where if you move it, it will do double damage. And corruption shot starts with a pretty high hit and then kind of slowly does less damage over each bleed hit, but it can spread to multiple targets, which gives it a a lot of damage over time and is a pretty strong ability. Technically, Fragmentation Shot can be boosted by lunging, but it's typically not worthwhile because the multiplier gets reduced and the damage increase from lunging is not really worthwhile. The only time you would see a lunging swap being used is when you're trying to use Frag Shot on a static target, but that is some pretty try-hard stuff and most people don't bother with it, so only go for something like that if you have just literally infinite disposable income. Greater Ricochet is the bread and butter of all range rotations. It is a hyper strong basic ability and you should be pretty much using it whenever it's off global cooldown. It is definitely a crown jewel basic and how it works is if there are no other targets in view, it will just put all of the hits onto the single target that would have gone out normally. And it gets boosted by the Karoming perk so you can have up to seven hits going out at once. So if I go ahead and Gricko this target here, you will see that there are five hit splats on the main target, but then one goes to each of the other ones. But if I go over here and spawn a dummy real fast, and there's no other targets close by, and I hit Gricko, all seven hits will go on. Now, the bulg proc went ahead and happened, so you saw an extra hit in there, but at least you understand now how this ability works. As far as thresholds are concerned, there are two main thresholds that you're going to be using, which are Snapshot and Rapid Fire. Snapshot is a one global cooldown ability where it fires two decently powerful shots on it, but it does consume 15% adrenaline. Rapid Fire just fires out eight hits, it is a channeled ability and it does decent damage per hit, but it's mostly for the effect and Dracolich is the reason people channel this out. Shadow Tendrils is a very strong threshold. However, it does take away a bit of your health, so you have to be careful when using it. But its cooldown of 45 seconds pretty much limits it to one time use inside of your Death Swift and that's about it. However, if you're trying to AoE clear something, this can be very strong. I forgot to mention Snipe in the basic ability section, but it is very strong strong, definitely worthwhile. However, it is kind of weird to get used to the timing because you have to wait an extra game tick for it to pop off as global cooldown is only 1.8 seconds, but this ability will fire after 2.4 seconds. Tight bindings is a decent threshold ability. However, it does get buffed by flanking and that's where it's mostly going to get used. It is also a stun just like its basic counterpart binding shot. Overall, not a bad threshold, but you probably won't be using this too much 
outside of a flanking swap. Now a threshold that is not on my bar is Salt the Wound, and that's over here. I don't really use this one too much as keeping MDS stacks is usually pretty annoying, and most rotations don't account for it because the damage really isn't worthwhile. And even with a splintering arrow swap, I went ahead and tested in between recording bits. Uh, I saw a Salt the Wound at max stack of 13 stacks. Do about 12 and a half thousand damage that wasn't in DS or anything like that. So maybe it's something that could be brought out and used, but I don't see it getting used a whole lot as it's probably not worth the effort, but it is something you could experiment if you really want to. And another threshold that is not on my bar is Bombardment. Overall, it's a fairly weak ability. Snipe is a basic ability that does more damage than it, so typically you're not going to be using this. It is an AoE, but it's also kind of a weak AoE and it doesn't double dip if you're using any sort of chin or decimation. So overall, this is kind of just a bad ability and should really be avoided as literally using any of the AOEs with snipe is going to do more damage to each of the targets and grant you extra adrenaline. As far as ultimate abilities are concerned, there are three that people are typically using. Death Swiftness or Greater Death Swift in this case is going to do 38 second duration and give you a 50% damage buff during this. And the point of Death Swiftness is to optimize your basic and threshold usage inside of your death swift duration to then maximize the amount of damage you're doing. Deadshot is a damage over time or a bleed as it's commonly known as, and it does pretty good damage, especially when it's being buffed by the Igneous Cal Zuck or the Zuck Cape for short. Overall, it's pretty good to use in between death swift rotations or if you're using poison builds, it is definitely worthwhile to use because each of those bleed hits is going to count as a source of healing for a blood reaver effect. And overall, it is pretty strong. It doesn't feel as strong as Omni Power or Overpower to those respective combat styles. As far as all of the abilities that are buffed by the Zuck Cape, Deadshot definitely feels lagging behind, but that's because range has other things that it needs to be doing to do more damage. And by no means does this ability really need a buff. Range is already doing extreme amounts of damage. It is still a very strong ability nonetheless. Incendiary Shot acts like Tsunami or Meteor Strike for their respective combat styles. It gives you a 30 second duration in which any crit you do will give 8% adrenaline. However, the important thing to know is that when you press Tsunami or you press Meteor Strike, you get the crit buff instantly. However, with Incendiary Shot, there is a delay between you firing the ability and it blowing up inside of the target. And when that animation happens, that's when you get the crit buff. So something you don't want to do is hit incendiary shot and then immediately expect a Gricko afterwards to work because the hits from the Gricko will go out before you actually get the crit buff. So typically what I like to do is after incendiary shot, I'll use something like piercing shot in a dummy build before my Gricko to space it out properly. Or if I'm doing something like a death swift rotation with an A pot, I'll just go ahead and hit Gricko anyway and not worry about the crit adren. You could also put incendiary shot before death swiftness, but then it runs out a little early in your DS. I'll kind of go over those things later when we're talking about rotations specifically. As far as gear progression is concerned with range, I'm just gonna talk over some of the big picture items. If you want a full list of the gear progression with every single thing in it. PVME Discord has a full list of the gear progression order that most people will recommend. However, what I would recommend is obviously at first you're going to start off with probably a Dark Boat EOF that's going to be first and foremost. It's a cheap spec to go in the amulet and the amulet itself is pretty strong. Then after your EOF, I would probably go with something like Gricko as your next big ticket item. It's a very strong ability and even on a Nox Bow or a physical SGB, it's going to work well wonders. Highly recommend Gricko. Now the two after this can kind of be done in a separate order, but you could either go for ECB EOF and start getting out damage that way, or you could save up for something like a physical SGB. Now, yes, this is just a keepsake, but imagine I'm just holding a normal SGB here. And then whichever one you didn't get, you can get afterwards and you have access to ECB spec. You have access to SGB spec. You have access to the God arrows that are very powerful. The only thing you don't have access 
to is Boa the Last Guardian, but when you save up and get Boa the Last Guardian after doing this, you can then just take your physical SGB, which I wouldn't do a dyed one, obviously, but you can take your physical one, put it into an EOF, and then you have all three main EOFs here with a Bow of the Last Guardian. Now, as far as armor progression, I would just sit on the tier 90 Serenic armor. If we hop over to the max guild real quick, I'll show you how cheap this armor set is. It is ridiculously inexpensive for what it does. So if we just type in Serenic here, we have the tier 90 mask, which is sub one mil. We have the tier 90 legs, which are about two mil. And then the body is a whopping 2.6 mil. So for well under 10 mil GP, you have tier 90 armor that will last you all the way through these upgrades before you look into something like Draco Lich. Now you might be thinking to yourself, car guy, why would you recommend to go with the tier 90 90 Serenic rather than the tier 90 Draco Lich. And that's because the tier 90 Draco Lich is only a 20% crit buff when you proc the rapid fire effect. And for the cost of the armor, I don't really think it is worth putting money into that armor set early on when Gricko and the EOFs are going to do a lot more damage for you. Also early on, right around when you're getting your Dark Boat EOF and you're on a Nox, I honestly would go pretty early on a Grim. Now, yes, this can be expensive up front, but getting used to using death spore arrows and other things like when arrows are full arrows or using dragon banes, but switching between the arrow types, learning that early on, I think would be worth its weight in gold and making death spores as least obnoxious as possible. So using things like Calgurian Demon and Grimoire are going to make that learning process significantly easier. And Calgurian Demons are actually pretty cheap. If we go to favorites here, the Calgs, they're pretty cheap, around 100k a familiar, so it's about 100k an hour. And you only use one scroll a minute, so you might use maybe 30 of these scrolls per hour because they only proc when you're in combat. So when you're going through wars and you're getting back to the boss portal and you're getting your adrenaline stuff, it's not going to be proccing. But at most, I might use 50 to 60 of these an hour, and they're not terribly expensive compared to something like using a Blood Reaver, which is very expensive, or Ripper Demon, which can get really expensive and they don't provide crit chance. But before I got distracted, you need like, I think it's 90 or 100 of these spikes to make the tier 90 armor set, which is only giving you the 20% crit buff after rapid. And so if we just take GE value for what it's worth, and then we multiply that by 90, which I think it's actually 99, but we're talking about the same price as Gricko for an armor set that you then have to spend another roughly 1.3 to 1.5 billion GP on to then get it full effect and I think that GP is much better spent on going for EOFs and the weapon itself and I would put Draco Lich in the same category as like buying the T99. If you come across a bunch of GP for some reason I guess go ahead and get it but I would do these last. Now as far as rotations go I'm going to go ahead and go over the big picture idea for a Death Swift rotation and then we'll go ahead and do an example. So typically what I do before I start a DS rotation is I will equip my death spore arrows and try and build up some death spore stacks. And once I get the effect started and I see the little countdown, that's when I go ahead and hit death swiftness, get my free adrenaline refund from it, and then go ahead and hit incendiary shot. So that way during the rest of my death swift, I have the crit adrenaline gain and it works out very nicely stacking with things like rapid fire and other things of the sort, giving me a lot of adrenaline. Gricko is a very strong adrenaline gainer. It's even used in melee rotations to help gain adrenaline it's very strong and now that we're on the range combat style we just get to use it for free and my overall goal is that if sgb works on the target that i am doing i will attempt to get in two sgbs two rapid fires a snapshot or two although that one's kind of iffy and as many dark bows that adrenaline will allow me to do without fully draining and compromising myself on adrenaline. Alrighty, so getting into the actual example here, I'm gonna go ahead and use when arrows and let that damage kind of go through, but understand that these rotations can also work with full arrows just fine. And also I am using a Grim and a Cal Demon on the auto cast just to help out with crit chance a little bit. But anyways, it would look something like this. So we'll go ahead and hit our grit go. We're on three stacks, I'll hit my piercing shot another ability go for another piercing shot and then we got our stacks i'm going to delay one more ability and then hit my ds and my incendiary shot i'm going to go ahead and hit gricko 
SGB into an ECB. And then just go ahead and hit Limitless Rapid Fire. We got our proc, so then I can go ahead and use my bow spec into a snap, into a dark bow. Gricko, another dark bow. And here I'm going to piercing shot into a tendrils, to another piercing shot, get another ECB, go for my second rapid. Go for a dark bow, into a Gricko, into our second SGB. And then from here on out, I would go ahead and build, use divert, anything else I need to, maybe go for some type of dead shot in between, and then build up for another rotation. Now with when arrows, I find it nice to go ahead and get a Greco off as the first ability to then build stacks. So that way your SGB and your rapid fire do get a buff. Now I know there are some rotations out there that you can do. Actually, I'm gonna call this guy real quick since he's wanting to just keep on the dummy. But like I was saying, there are other rotations I've seen where you go for a bow spec in ECB before you start your death swift in order to have those already going so it makes it easier to maximize your death swift rotation. And there is quite a bit of improv with this. However, from my testing so far, I think the most important thing is two rapids, two SGBs, and two ECBs. Those seem to be the important ones. And the nice thing about the tendrils in the middle that I did after a Gricko is that the first first one is a guaranteed crit and the second one usually crits so you can get some nice guaranteed adrenaline off of that but overall that's kind of a general rotation I go for and I want to take this last part of the guide to actually talk about some other things like stalling Nami here and how that all works so essentially what you do is you go up to an adrenaline crystal you get 100% adren you stall Nami on this dummy get more adren come back over and then release it with a natty instinct and then that allows you to then build up adrenaline very quickly with G conk and then what I've seen done after that is they have the bow spec already going they will start the DS and then hit Greco again for the big adrenaline buff because you have natural instinct doubling your adren gain on the crit buff from the Nami and then hit ECB after that and then go immediately for an SGB as soon as the boss spawns now this rotation I have seen at Raksha and be put to good effect there but it also depends on the boss you're doing because some others will have a startup animation that takes longer and allows you to do some type of build like this, like Raksha, for example, or say you're in an elite dungeon where as soon as you surge in, you are immediately starting. There is no actual animation for most of those. So builds like Nami, it's hard for me to give a general recommendation for those simply because the build is going to be pretty specific on which boss you're actually doing. And you'll see more of the fancy stuff like that in the guides that I'm doing in the future. Now, don't worry if I do a method at say Raksha or something coming up in the near future. I will have a version that uses like the super high-end fast stalls and everything, but I will also try and incorporate a version that is a more straightforward farming method within the same video. But overall, these principles in Death Swift rotations are pretty much what I follow, which again is two Rapids, two SGBs, and two ECBs. If in the future we get ECB off global cooldown, that would be absolutely massive for DS rotations, at least in just getting off the two ECB parts and making sure you're always under the effect and would make it a lot simpler to actually get out these rotations. But until that day, which I don't even know if it's gonna show up or not, we'll just have to play around it accordingly. Also, I know when arrows are absolutely overtuned right now as far as damage and ability to cook off at bosses, and I can see them getting some type of nerf and full arrows probably coming back into the picture, but we don't know if that's even in the works right now. Nothing has really been mentioned, it's just a few PVMers saying, hey, these are entirely too strong, something needs to be done about this. But instead of rambling on about that for another 10 minutes or some other topic, I think I'm just going to call the video here. Thank you very much for watching, your viewership is greatly appreciated. Have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, nighttime, whatever it is, wherever you are, and I will see you next time for the next guide. Peace!